is. Um, I'm going to be super duper analog and not have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to walk around on stage instead. Um, I wrote this book, my little red book, it's called Radical Attention. It came out uh, in 2021 and has done a lot better than I thought it was going to. And in my creative writing classes, I usually start by asking students to introduce themselves by telling me three true things about themselves. So I'm going to tell you three true things about myself which relate to some of the things that you've just heard. The first thing is that my sister has ADHD. The second thing is that she is head of design at Google and she is currently designing the Google uh, search page. You will see at some point in the near future something that she's done um, and she is quite likely shitting herself about it, I would say. And the third true, true thing about me is that I tried her ADHD drugs. They were very nice. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I also want to tell you why I wrote Radical Attention. So I wrote an essay. I've really been a very analog person in my life, generally. It took a long time to get a smartphone, etc., etc. And I wrote an article that was published um, in the Times Literary Supplement about my Oxford interview, which was a bin fire, that's all I can say. And it went viral. And it went viral to the point where I was on my phone in the toilet, I was answering messages while I was crossing the street. I was absolutely overwhelmed by the demands of my smartphone. This had never happened to me before and I didn't know what to do. And after about two days of not sleeping, having a headache, going, oh my God, what am I supposed to do about this? I realized that actually I needed to get rid of my phone. So I put the phone in the fridge and I tried to meditate for a couple of days. I ignored my social media and I thought, what's, what the hell's just happened to me? Something really strange has happened to my neurobiology. Something strange has happened to my body. Something has kind of taken me over. And I'm sure you're all very aware of how on the, in the smartphone leverages your attention by tapping into a really primal part of your brain. It's one of the reasons why I'm wearing a headset to talk to you. I rather wish you'd be able to see my nice haircut, but you can't because it's too distracting trying to talk to you with all of this sound and noise going on in the background because my old school brain is always looking out for danger. It's trying to make sure that I stay safe. So when my phone pings, I think, oh shit, there's somebody coming after me. And there's a, a, a neuroscientist who said it, I think, better than me in quite a poetic way called Oliver Hart. I just want to read... a. Uh, quote from him and he says a human is a very vulnerable animal and the only reason we're not extinct is that we have a superior brain to avoid predation and find food we have to be really good and at being attentive to our environment our attention can shift rapidly around and when it does everything else that was being attended to stops which is why it's difficult to multitask when we focus on something it's a survival mechanism. You're in the savannah or the jungle and you hear a branch crack, you give your total attention to that, which is useful. It causes a short stress reaction, a slight arousal, activates the nervous system, it optimizes your cognitive abilities and sets you up for fight or flight. But it's much less useful 30,000 years later when we're here with the exact same brain and every phone notification we hear is a twig snapping in the forest stimulating what was important to what we were, a frightened little animal. That frightened little animal, I realized, was me on smartphone overload. So my method as a writer and a teacher of writing is to always try and think about where I'm standing in relation to the thing that I'm looking at. So I'm not just looking at social media, particularly as a phenomenon that affects the world, but as one that has had a very particular and peculiar effect on me and also on my family. And as a writer in the world, to me, and this is one of the things that I teach, it's the beginning and the end of your writing practice. In my teaching practice, I've always held to John Berger's assertion that we never look at just one thing. We're always looking at the relationship between things and ourselves. And to me, this capacity to look is situated in my attention. And this is what we train in writing classes, particularly in creative writing classes, the capacity to attend, to make connections between the world and our ideas. Attention is the capacity to be consciously aware of our surroundings and of ourselves in relation to that surrounding. 
And the philosopher Simone Weil, she's one of my favorites, and you'll see a lot of articles on the internet where I've talked about her a lot. She was an amazing person. It's worth looking her up if you're interested. And she says, attention consists of suspending thought, leaving it detached, empty, and ready to be penetrated by the object. It means holding in our minds, but within reach of this thought, but on a lower level and not in contact with it, all the diverse knowledge that we've acquired. Now that might sound a bit gnomic, but if you think about it, key to understanding her is the principle that attention is embedded in your body. And it's often blocked by pride or judgment or predetermination or competitiveness, by thinking too much, by putting yourself in the way. That's how we make mistakes. So attention, she doesn't mean attention in the sense of it being a passive or meditative state from which all feelings are removed but a place of conscious receptiveness, just being in your body and noticing the world. It's very simple in a way, not just in a superficial way, but with a kind of curiosity that comes from inside that embedded consciousness. And it's in this state of mind, she argues, that it produces revelations, insights, moment of clarity, and is the object of all studies, because it's the place where moral reasoning becomes possible. It, has, it allows us to see that this man who's hungry and thirsty really exists as much as I do. And that's enough. The rest follows. So when we think about attention in this way, what we're thinking about is the capacity to direct our lives, to choose what we want to do. She defined freedom as a relationship between our thoughts and being able to act. And if you're able to think for yourself and then act on those thoughts, then you're free. But in our new techno-reality, if our thoughts are always being hijacked from underneath us, how can we know how to act? And therefore, how are we free? So to give you another example, recently I posted on my Facebook feed a video of the philosopher and YouTuber Natalie Wynn, some of you might be familiar with ContraPoints, talking about JK Rowling and trans rights. The video is two hours long, very in-depth, and it's, a, it's an analysis from the point of view of a trans woman. It's very nuanced, useful information and a riposte to a lot of misinformation that's out there on the internet. It didn't get very many likes because it's a two hour long video. I didn't put any commentary and, you know, TLDNR for most of the people on my timeline. But following this, unbidden, unsolicited, Facebook suggested that I would be interested in a conversation between two writer acquaintances of mine who were having what we might call an extremely turfy conversation and saying some pretty unpleasant things about trans people. Of course, I was immediately outraged and primed myself at the keyboard to write a long response. And then I caught myself and I thought, who has suggested to me that I look at this conversation? Why? Did the Facebook algorithm make no distinction between pro or anti-trans rights discussion? Was it trying to nudge me into making or getting so cross that that turfy discussion would blow up and create more engagement so they can sell more advertising to the makers of cat beds? I've just got a cat, so I'm being advertised absolutely shed loads of artisanal cat products at the moment. Essentially, the algorithm was what we might call shit-stirring, to get me involved, and the tyranny of this situation, is that that shit-stirring has real-world consequences for the trans people that I know who are frequently abused in real life, on the streets, just for the sake of flogging advertising to the makers of cat beds. We know that what happens on social media doesn't stay on social media. Twitter call-outs become news, which become cancel careers. Instagram posts become court cases. Facebook disinformation becomes anti-vaccination protests. What started off as an opportunity to share cat videos has a much deeper political and social consequence than anyone in Silicon Valley could ever have imagined. The genie is out of the bottle. And the challenge I would suggest to those of you who have some power to change the dynamic is to try and think ethically about how we want to use it rather than having it use us. But because it's incredibly overwhelming and difficult to unpick, we tend towards blaming the individual rather than the system. 
which is why we get so many books titled How to Quit Your Smartphone in 30 Days, How to Take a Social Media Break, Why Your Smartphone is Ruining Your Life, etc., etc. Because, of course, it's our lack of self-control that's to blame, not the fact that these, these addictive, dissociative, outrage states are baked into the software by design. The systems are predatory because they want my data in order to get profit to sell you the advertising. If they keep me on longer, they can sell more ad space. And I've watched students and friends disappear into anti-vaccination rabbit holes, become virulently turfy, or lose themselves to conspiracy theories. Who is prompting that thinking? Is that free? But it doesn't have to be that way. In a recent study, which I recommend you looking up, I think it was published in March this year, called I Don't Even Remember What I Read, How Design Influences Dissociation on Social Media, which is a collaborative study from the University of Washington. You can find the video on YouTube. The researchers considered how very small design tweaks on Twitter could create a much more satisfying experience for the users without affecting their bottom line. And they said they found that design interventions, including allowing the participants to do custom lists, reading history labels, time limit dialogues and usage statistics, reduced dissociation and improved satisfaction with the platform. Even small things can create a kinder environment. And I think this is interesting because dissociative states are what we mean when we talk about a state of flow. When we're working and we don't notice that the sun has set or our legs gone to sleep, our attention is absorbed into a task. We don't even notice that the twig has snapped in the forest. But when we're in a situation of passive dissociation, literally just do zoning out in front of the doom scroll, we're being hijacked by a set of ideas that are deliberately capturing ideas for profit. And what use are passive people to society, or to community, or even to themselves? Filled with bad feeling and self-loathing, it might mean 15 minutes longer on Twitter, but what is the quality of that time, both for the platform and for the individual? And what are the actual consequences for the vulnerable, for the planet, and for our current dumpster fire of politics? So I'll finish by just asking you to consider, because I'm a writer and I spend my life thinking about how we use language, the different ways that we talk about attention. Iris Murdoch says in her essay, The Sovereignty of Good, that morality is a matter of attention, not will. We need a new vocabulary of attention, which I think is one of the things that the Attention Studies Center is trying to do. To this end, the verbs that we use around attention are very revealing. To pay attention describes a transaction, specifically a financial one. In French, it's faire attention, to make attention. In Spanish, to prestar attention, to lose attention. In Persian, attention is something that you do. In Russian, attention is something you turn. In Vietnamese, is attention is something you look. And in Finnish, attention is something we attach. These differences somehow seem crucial to the way in which our different cultures think about time and value. In our mercantile, transactional Anglosphere, paying attention acknowledges a cost in every single thing we look at. Our attention gets spent. But my favorite is in Hebrew. To pay attention is generally lasim lev, or to set your heart to it. What if we agreed that we could set our hearts to attend to attention? What opportunities might there be for change? What happens if attention is from the heart rather than from the wallet? What new truths would we find? What new vocabulary of attention could we write? What lives might be improved? How might the world be changed? Thank you.